Welcome to everyone to our closing plenary for the Sankalp Global Summit 2021. It has been an incredible few days for all of us, organizers, attendees, and partners. This week through Sankalp, we have reached millions of people across every continent and have had participation from 77 countries. We have seen nearly 900 meeting requests go out and we've curated 58 sessions with a focus on climate change, agriculture, financial inclusion, impact investing, and of course, women to name a few. 94,000 people voted for the Sankalp Global Awards 2021. There was a moment yesterday where four simultaneous sessions were talking about women's economic empowerment, driving capital to women entrepreneurs and women's health. This was not by design and we had not listed these under our gender focused sessions. This is something we really wanted to weave through our conversations at Sankal, and we can't be more proud that our gender lens has been able to shine through like this. We hope you have found it as inspirational as we have. I am honored that we have had the opportunity to host not one, but two Nobel laureates this Sankal. Sharing a stage with Professor Muhammad Yunus is definitely the highlight of my career. I hope you found their work inspirational and that they have strengthened your resolve to echo the words of Mr. Kailar Satyarthi. We would like to wrap up the summit by encouraging your resolve around climate change. We all know that addressing climate change goes far beyond turning off the lights in your house. It has much to do with the financing that is going to fossil fuels. The 60 largest commercial and investment banks have collectively financed $3.8 trillion in fossil fuel companies between 2016 and 2020, the five years since the Paris Agreement was signed. On the positive side, interest in sustainable investment is rising fast. A record $20.6 billion was put into sustainable fund funds in the US alone in 2019, which is nearly four times more than in 2018. More still needs to be done to mobilize critical investment into climate finance to achieve the global climate goals. To kickstart this conversation, I would like to introduce Dr. Ajay Mathur, Director General of the International Solar Alliance. The International Solar Alliance was conceived as a coalition of solar resource-rich countries to address their special energy needs. The ISA provides a dedicated platform for cooperation among solar resource rich countries through which the global community can contribute to help achieve the common goal of increasing the use and quality of solar energy in a safe, convenient, affordable, equitable and sustainable manner. Dr. Mathur earlier headed the Energy and Resources Institute, the Indian Bureau of Energy Efficiency, and was responsible for mainstreaming energy efficiency in houses, offices, and industries through a number of innovative initiatives. He was a leading climate change negotiator and was the Indian spokesperson at the Paris Climate Negotiations. He served as the interim director of the Green Climate Fund during, fund during its foundational period. He was also a member of the Indian Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change. He has had a very distinguished career focused on climate change, and I could spend the next hour talking about this, but I would really like to welcome Dr. Mathur to Sankal and let him take on. Welcome Dr. Sankal, Dr. Mathur to Sankal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Urvashi. It's a pleasure to be with you and with all the people who have joined us on this final session of Sankal. I also want to thank Sankal for bringing together this great group of participants for this session. I look forward to the discussions. But before I begin, I must obviously welcome each one from my side as well. And whatever time of the day it is in your part of the world, a very good morning or good afternoon or good evening to you. I'm actually delighted that we are talking on this session of how do we get resources flowing into the climate sector. And I would like to emphasize the title, Revisiting Investment Priorities. And I think the revisiting is important. I would like to consider this a bit of a sensitive subject, not sensitive in a political sense, 
but sensitive in a more traditional decision-making sense. Why is it sensitive? Well, first of all, it's sensitive because it affects our money flows today. Where do we put in money? Do we put it into money into places where we know we will get a safe return or where we expect we will get a safe return? It's a perceptional issue. But data is now coming out on the side of where we expect a safer return. But the second issue also I think is important, and that is how do we take care of future generations? To a certain extent, it's an extension of what I just said. But what is important is that the investments that we do today serve our need today, tomorrow, and the day after. I would like to emphasize that things have definitely changed for the better over the last few years, thanks to the huge public response to, uh, towards actions on climate change. The high level advocacy by academia, by scientific community, by many political leaders has helped push this along. But now we are also seeing this occur in the core groups, where we are seeing that shareholder activism is leading to board members and oil companies losing their seats because of their views on future investments. I would also like to say that in many, many development institutions, particularly the multilateral development institutions, the development finance institutions, the sovereign funds, the aid agencies, philanthropies, in all of these, climate has become a mainstream investment activity. According to the 2020 joint report on the multilateral development banks, the invested something of the order of 30% of their total portfolio on climate related projects in mitigation and in adaptation, 30%. This was something close to $66 billion. And mind you, the year before that, this number was 25 billion. So you can see the kind of increase that is occurring year on year. Of this 66 billion that was invested in 2020, approximately 60%, 58% if I'm not wrong is the exact number, was committed to low and middle income countries. That's where the resources are needed. That's where interest rates at which people can afford to pay for solar energy is needed. Now, this all sounds like good news, but uh, you know, look at the title of this, Revisiting Investment Priorities. That suggests that all is not hunky-dory. Um, the latest year for which I have data, 2018, just 1% of the assets of the 100 largest pension funds in the world were invested in low car carbon solutions. So that gives you an idea that there are many, many things that we still need to address. And I'd like to leave you with three questions that I think we need to think about. The first is, are the current investment levels satisfactory? And if not, what is the gap? The second is, are we firing on all cylinders? Or are there funding agencies that are still shying away from investing in climate change? And the third is, are the investments resulting in a measurable impact in the right places? So quantity, the number of funds, and is it effective? So these are the three key questions that I think all investors need to keep in mind as we go ahead. I will try to give a few answers, and I hope that the panel can throw some light on these as well. I mean, I don't want to steal that under, but I'm, I'm suggesting that these are issues that we need to look at. Now, as for my first question, are the current investment levels enough? The answer is clearly no. While climate finance has reached record levels and the 66 billion from the uh, multilateral funds is an example of that, the action is far short of what is needed to reach the 1.5 degree scenario or even the two degree scenario, we're nowhere near that. Estimates of the investments that are required uh, go anywhere between 1.6 trillion and 3.8 trillion. Many, many times where we are 
today. This is not for one year. This is for the period between 2016 and 2050. But, for, but it is for the supply side alone, not for the user side. Now, as far as the second question, are we attacking the problem with all our might? The answer, unfortunately, again, is no. There is a lot that needs to be done to unlock and enable the flow of capital, particularly private capital, into financing mitigation and more importantly, financing adaptation priorities against climate change. There remains, I believe, a strong lack of a business case for climate adaptation. Now, what is very clear is that the private sector responds to strong market forces. And market forces, which they will see, will give them a decent return on investment. Project preparation facilities are key to help build up a project pipeline. And I'm sure that my fellow speaker, uh, Mr. Rajiv Mahajan from the Green Climate Fund, will certainly focus on this issue and what I'm trying to say in this regard. I would also request my other fellow speaker, Abhishek Koder from Macquarie, to share his insights from the perspectives of an asset manager. From what I've read, Macquarie has joined the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative and pledged to invest and manage its portfolio in line with global net zero emissions by 2040. It's an ambitious move in a very competitive industry. And may I say, Abhishek, how proud I am that Macquarie is on board. I think this is the kind of actions we need from all investment managers. As for the last question that I put forth regarding measurable impact in the right places, the answer is a weak yes. Why a weak yes? Because during the past decades, investment in clean energy has been limited in the developed countries and in certain pockets of the developing world. China, India are examples. But in recent years, and this has been one of the ISA's experiences, there is a large part of the developing world which is well, long, well a long way from forming and following a comprehensive climate change strategy due to a lack of credible investment. The investment doesn't flow. If it does flow, it is very expensive. And you can imagine, when we are talking of renewables, the cost of capital matters. Because if you're making electricity from fossil fuels, approximately 50% of the cost of electricity is the fossil fuel cost itself. So the plant and the equipment is 50%. But in renewables, nearly 95%, 98% of the cost is the cost of capital and equipment. There are no fossil fuel equivalent costs in this. You can imagine, therefore, that if it is all capital cost, the price of money, the cost of money becomes very important. We are seeing that in many, many developing countries, the cost of money is absurdly high. They feel much more comfortable in moving on with fossil fuel projects because they make more economic sense. Um, we need to ensure that the concept of a just transition that requires a transition towards a climate neutral economy happens in a fair way and leaves nobody, no country behind. I hope my fellow uh, speaker, my colleague, Jagjit Sareen from the International Solar Alliance would be able to share some insights on how investments can be fine-tuned to result in equitable discipline development, in holistic development, in the least developed countries and in the small island developing states across social, economic, and gender boundaries within those countries. I leave you with these thoughts and hand it over to Ms. Jessica Seddon, who I'm so delighted is here to moderate the panel. Uh, Jessica, your work at the Ross Center has been an amazing uh, Initi you know, the initiatives that you have taken have been of great leadership. You have provided leadership. They have been an example to us on how to move ahead. Urvashi, many thanks. 
And I again welcome you and everybody else to this closing plenary of the 13th Sankalp Global Summit 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur. Uh, you have really set the stage for the next panel discussion. And we really thank you for uh, all of your leadership on climate change for all of this time. Uh, I was a very, uh, a decade ago, I was working on climate change and I used to follow your work at the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And <laughs> thank you so much for staying with it. <laughs> um, really appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I, I think you have, uh, I will now take a moment to actually introduce our moderator, Jessica, for the next segment. Uh, Jessica is the global lead for air quality at the World Resources Institute. Her work focuses on the way that new sources of information and environmental awareness can be leveraged to motivate and guide cost-effective strategies for reducing polluting emissions and achieving clean air for all. Prior to this, she set up OKAPI and has worked at IIHS, IFM, IFMR Center for Development Finance, IDFC Institute, IIT Madras, and is an expert in the sector. Jessica, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Arishi, and, and thank you um, to IntelliCap for inviting me to moderate this panel. It actually, for the past uh, couple of decades, I've been in and out of development finance or the practice of converting money into social value. And so for me, it's an honor to be able to, to, to moderate this particular panel because I think as Dr. Martha laid out, we now face one of the greatest challenges yet for not only our species, but also all of the other inhabitants of the planet. What we have to do in a very short period of time, years to decades, is to rapidly transform infrastructure, services, business as usual, while also managing to ensure a continuous improvement in standards of living for all. The just transition is an incredibly important boundary, but both the just and the transition take some doing. Climate finance is really where the ideas hit the road. It's the translation of the resources we have into the kinds of lives and support and context that we need. And I think what's been in the headlines um, around the world is really kind of the discussion of how much, what's enough. But I think the practical details of how whatever we are investing is spent how it is converted into innovation, how it's converted into new practices at a time when we have incredible pace of technology change, entrepreneurship, when the scientific understanding of what's right, what is a high return in a social sense is evolving is an extremely important uh, practical but also uh, institutional design challenge. And I'm very happy to be joined today by a group of panelists who I think can shed light from a combined, I was trying to count the number of decades of experience we have on the, on the panel. I think it's about you know, between 60 and 70 um, years worth of personal and professional experience in development finance and converting money into infrastructure services and uh, the other context that we need. So without further ado, I just want to introduce the panelists and then turn the mic over to them. I don't want to occupy the, the, the space for too much when we have this kind of panel. So we have um, Rajiv Mahajan, who is the head of project finance private sector facility for the Green Climate Fund. He has more than two decades of experience in India's project finance world, particularly on infrastructure. And in the, in the last four or five years, he's also set up GCF's project finance franchise, working and building a team across geographies as diverse as Africa, Latin America, and Central Asia. We have Abhishek Podar, who is the managing director of Makari Infrastructure and Real Estate Assets. As in that position, he's responsible for sourcing investments, executing transactions, managing assets, and particularly stakeholder relationship management in infrastructure, renewables, and private equity. Prior to that, he has a couple of decades worth of experience consulting and implementing uh, corporate strategy, which I think is it, and I'd love to plumb into to those, the experience from, from that period. 
Our third panelist today, as Dr. Mathur mentioned, is Jagjit Saran, who is the Assistant Director General at the International Solar Alliance. International Solar Alliance, I'll let Jagjit speak more about what it is, but it, the mission is to unlock a trillion dollars of investment in solar by 2030, while at the same time reducing the cost of technology and its financing. Small things, a little, quite an ambitious project, and I think an example of the kind of vehicles through which climate finance uh, can flow. So what I'd like to do first, um, just for the, the, those of you, um, for to, is ask the, each of the panelists to talk a bit about what climate finance is from the perspective of their organizations. Um, and I wanna set that as a baseline for really underlining some of the policy, regulatory, financial structuring, the range of institutional design challenges that we face in scaling up both the impact and the quantum of climate finance. So I'll turn it over to you first, uh, Rajiv. Um, tell us a bit about Green Climate Fund and what is climate finance from the perspective of GCF? Thank you so much, Jessica. And it's, uh, it's, it's incredible to be on this panel with all of you today. Um, from our perspective, we are a young organization compared to many of you, compared to the Macquaries of the world and the development banks of the world, uh, where, let's say, you all come from, Jagjit and Jessica. Uh, so we are, we are the new kid of the block. Um, we are uh, just about six years old, uh, six years into our operations. And in these six years, um, I think we have, uh, we have kind of found a niche for ourselves. Uh, we do realize that um, climate change cannot happen um, just with uh, development banks and DFIs coming in to finance uh, climate projects. It just won't happen. Money has to be mobilized and money has to be mobilized to meet the requirements of of um, of the of the players in climate uh, in climate finance and climate investments and meet the needs of the countries without which it's not going to work. So we see ourselves as a catalyst, as as the principal catalyst that would trigger the mobilization of capital on the ground, uh, be it um, in in let's say a small island developing state, be it in a LDC, be it in a high emitting economy. Wherever it is, each of those has their unique um, uh, problems, uh, unique barriers, and we look at addressing those barriers one by one and, and using our um, expertise, our convening power, our capital to encourage um, markets to come on board and, and market forces to take over. It's only when market forces take over would we have uh, financing at scale coming into this sector, which is very much required. Um, we have done that in, in a few transactions. Um, and uh, as, as Dr. Mathur said, adaptation is, is an area of priority. Uh, well, uh, energy has got a lot of uh, financing so far, it's mainstream, but there are other areas which are not. Transportation is one which is, which is currently not mainstreamed in developing economies. Adaptation is not. Um, climate smart agriculture is not. We are focusing on those areas to mobilize capital over there uh, by addressing the barriers that those countries face. And, and we do that through um, our catalytic capital. Um, uh, with that, back to you, Jessica. Thank you. And I think that that, that um, emphasis on catalyzing and catalyzing more uh, of a market inflow into climate finance so that it's no longer climate finance, it's just finance in general. Um, I want to turn it over to Abhishek to speak a bit about um, climate finance from the perspective of Makari. Thanks, Jessica. Um, <clears throat> maybe just a 30 second intro about Macquarie, just to put my, my, my comment in the context. Uh, we are a very large Australian bank with over 50 years of, uh, of existence. Uh, the Macquarie real asset, Macquarie infrastructure real asset business that I represent, we are the world's largest infrastructure investors. Globally, we have deployed and we manage over $140 billion of equity uh, across different uh, infra and real asset categories, right? 
when it comes to climate financing or just the need for right climate management, I think we were possibly, as an infra investor, uh, the first set of people to, to have actually experienced why climate financing and climate management is, makes business sense. When you invest in infrastructure, when you have once in a hundred years kind of flooding happening every two years, when see, once you have uh, major, major volcanic eruptions happening in parts which, which, is, which creates issues for your geothermal situation, you're not, but this becomes mainstream. This becomes a boardroom conversations for us, right? So, you know, we've, we've, we've actually been looking into this from a pure business perspective for many years, and we've actually ended up spending a lot of money uh, ensuring that, that our assets are resilient when it comes to disaster management. Now, taking it further, what we've gone is, is next steps. Now, as we invest in new assets, we absolutely ensure this becomes a very important part of our diligence itself, where the, the assets that we are acquiring have the basic ingredients of managing the climate uh, variabilities as it, as it may happen itself, right? Then comes the entire aspects of climate financing itself, right? Being a for-profit organization, obviously, at the end of the day, we do measure in terms of, uh, of the returns that are possible. As Rajiv was saying, uh, the energy financing is actually found, has become mainstream, so quite a bit. There's a lot of capital out there. But what we do in, end up working is uh, work with, with organizations like GCF, which is able to bring in some interesting nature of capital. You know, it's not grant, but um, interesting nature of concessional capital, certain high risk capital. We're able to then blend in commercial capital that we bring to the table and our investors bring to the table and then provide solutions which can really enable uh, the next generation growth, right? Electric vehicles, green hydrogen. So I think that's one way that we do it. The, the other way which we are also doing is just corporate commitments, which Dr. Mathur had met, met, talked about, right? So we've gone out and clearly communicated by 2040, all our assets, this is 140 billion and more that we'll acquire, will be net zero. And 2040 is what we've given to the market. I know internally 2030 is when we've said we need to have a clear line of sight for that, right? So it's about, about taking some of these bold steps which then passes on the message to the market and the investor group that we can that we represent, saying this is real. This makes business sense. It's not just about theory. It needs to be applied in in real life situation. That just hopefully gives you a sense of how we are approaching this entire problem at our end. Great, thank you. And I want to come back to that point on the the blended finance and how Macquarie and GCF work together in the next part of the of, of the discussion because I think it's an important example of kind of the the innovation and the leadership uh, that that we need. Um, Jagjit, I wonder if you could say a bit about the International Solar Alliance and also your perspective on climate finance. What is climate finance to you? Sure. Uh, so. First of all, thank you to IntelliCap for inviting me to this panel and thanks to you, Jessica, for taking time to moderate our discussion. Um, so uh, maybe 30 seconds on how I, I come to this issue of climate finance. So uh, from 07 to 13, I was in UNFCCC Secretariat as a UN diplomat facilitating climate finance negotiations. Uh, so I've seen this go from hundreds of millions to hundreds of billions of dollars of negotiations within UNFCCC context from where GCF was born. And I was fortunate to be part of the design team of GCF and then moved to the World Bank again in the climate finance at climate investment funds. And from there, I got seconded to ISA in 2018. So I've done a bit of a detour, uh, if you will, on climate finance from various perspectives. Let me now um, uh, kind of lay it out for your audience, what it means for ISA um, climate finance. So in ISA, uh, which is an intergovernmental uh, treaty based organizations where member countries sign on to this treaty and make commitments um, to um, join ISA, there is a chapeau language which says that ISA member countries would endeavor to mobilize a trillion dollars in solar investment by 2030, as you referenced which seems like a very, very big goal. But if you break it down uh, every year, um, you know, give or take, we have about $150 billion of solar investments globally. 
you know, if you include China, US, and next 10 countries. But the problem lies in numbers itself. 80% of this 150 billion is concentrated in only 10 countries. If you go further down 20 countries, you will absorb about 95% of 150 billion. So rest of the world, which has huge solar potential, hardly has any sizable dollar investments in solar assets. So, you know, if you look at whole Africa in the last few years, the total um, installed capacity was only two gigawatts. So at ISA, what we have taken on a goal is to help make it equitable. So what we are talking is that this trillion dollars should help mobilize 1000 gigawatts of solar. It should also help address uh, the energy needs, the electricity needs of 1000 million people at the bottom of pyramid, if you will, who don't have access to electricity. And with all the efforts we are currently making, IEA and others estimate that about 600 million people would still not have electricity in 2030. So while I, I agree with my fellow panelists that energy climate finance is mainstream, but it's not enough. You know, with the current growth, we would have 600 million people without access to electricity in 2030. Would you want to imagine a world, uh, you know, if they don't develop, you know, forget about resilience. You know, as they say, development is the best form of resilience or adaptation you can ever have. If you don't have basic means to survive, you know, your resilience is out of the window anyway, if you have a window. Uh, <laughs> so at, at ISA, these are the three goals, if you will, which we are trying to crack. And for climate finance for us is, is the catalytic value it brings. Let me give you an example, and that may be a segue to the blended finance facility. So at ISA, when Dr. Mathur came in uh, six months ago, we started looking at this question that there are three kinds of financiers, people who bring in grant for upstream pre-implementation work, the project preparation work. Then you have the, the DFIs or sovereign uh, bilateral funding institution, which bring concessional lending and GCF and others. And then you have private sector capital, which is looking for green investments. Can we put it all together in a bucket? give them various kinds of returns, but invest these monies in solar projects in LDC and SIDS. Where frankly, you know, we globally we talk about adaptation, but in terms of the real dollar going in solar assets, uh, which can help solve their energy problems, whether it's off-grid or on-grid, it's very little. So at ISA, we are putting forward a proposal of a billion dollar mobilization through a blended finance facility, uh, uh, which would focus on risk mitigation. But we don't want to get the big boys or big girls off the hook, the institutional uh, capital of the world. At ISA, again, um, uh, we are trying to create a, a platform by which we will engage all the institutional capital of the world, whether it's CDPQ, Blackstone, BlackRock, Macquarie's and others and others, to help curate a conversation with policymakers so that these people then find investable projects whether aggregated or standalone in major economies, but also aggregated vehicles and LDC and SIDS. So at various levels, we are trying to use climate finance as a catalytic source of funding to bring in other source of capital, but focusing primarily on SIDS and LDCs because they are struggling with energy security access challenges and this money is not flowing there. Let me pause and come back later. Thank you. I think that's actually a very nice segue into uh, one of the sort of critical design challenges for uh, for climate finance. And I think just the, the inequities that are inherent in the energy sector, energy access, and some of the challenges of making sure that the quantum of investment on one side reaches to the kinds of entrepreneurs and their customers on the other who are most in need is where, in some ways, catalyzing market finance is the hardest. Um, I want to actually, you know, pick up on your point about the the blended finance and turn it back to um, to Abhishek. I mean, you started out with the point that in some ways nature forced mainstreaming, um, and the and Macquarie's emphasis on the the goals for its overall portfolio. When you look at the kinds of investments that Jagjit's calling for, the kinds of reorientation of capital to areas where the market has not gone for decades. What do you see as the key challenges for a Macquarie or your peers for moving into that space? And what role do you see for organizations like um, GCF? Uh, what would be some of, what are the things that are working now that we should amplify? And what are some of the obstacles that, you know, trouble you? Yeah. 
So Jessica, at the core of it comes down to the risk return from a pure private financier perspective, right? Everything comes down to a risk return paradigm. I'm, and I'm, I'm not talking from a corporate CSR perspective and leave those aside, right? The big box when they have to flow. <coughs> Uh, and this, you can look at from two lenses. One is the mainstream climate projects, let's say a solar in, in the less developed economies, right? Or new technologies, let's say a green hydrogen or electric vehicles, et cetera, even in the mainstream economy, right? Both, have, both of these have their own kind of risk profiles attached to it. Uh, you know, one case, like the industry is proven, but the economy presents a lot of uh, risk in terms of capital, regulatory framework and whatnot. And the second case, there's a technology risk side of things, right? Fundamentally, we as, as asset as, or capital allocators have to look at how much of risk can we actually absorb, you know, and, and ascribe capital to it. And that's where I think the blended finance that you're talking about, Jessica, becomes extremely handy, especially when there are risks which are, which are not, where many private capital will not be willing to take, right? Especially in the large infrastructure assets. So if you have likes of a GCF or X, X, you know, any other similar uh, multilateral en entity, which says, hypothetically, here's a, here's a pool of capital. I'm able to give you a concessionality, but beyond concessionality, let's say I'm able to write you as a first loss. Now that gives you that in my overall risk return paradigm just reduces my risk significantly. And in today's world, Jessica, let's be clear, capital availability is not an issue. There is a there is lot much more of capital trying to find good investable projects, right? It's about how do we ensure that the projects that we're talking about, whether it's new country, new technology is made investable. And that's where the role of, of, of uh, multilats come in. That's where the role of government comes in, in terms of enabling policy frameworks, et cetera, right? Uh, and only when all these stakeholders get together, uh, you will find financing and you, you will find significant amount of financing flow into this once the project gets, uh, investable, let me put it that way. Thank you. And, and I think at the end of the panel, we're going to come back to uh, a wish list and um, a little bit of a take on current trends in climate finance and what we want next, particularly with COP coming up. But I want to continue this thread and turn it back to, uh, to Rajiv to comment a bit. You mentioned when you were speaking about the GCF, a combination of convening as well as, as uh, catalyzing. And I wonder if you could respond to Abhishek's point about the, the way to set up some of these blended finance and then also what GCF, how GCF thinks about this um, notion of creating good investable projects in the settings that are most in need to enable this just transition. Sorry, small question. Okay, maybe uh, I should use an example uh, to illustrate what we had done. Um, so uh, if you look at uh, Egypt, uh, Egypt was one of our early investments in, in the solar space, uh, which we are incredibly proud of. It's operating currently. Um, in Egypt, um, they had a history of attempting to open up the market for investors in the solar space um, uh, way back since uh, 2014, 2015 didn't take off, there were bankability issues uh, in, in the contract structures. Um, we partnered there with, uh, there with the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, uh, structures were put into place to ensure that the contracts are bankable, that give comfort to investors to come in and invest. So that's the kind of convening power we were, uh, I was mentioning about. Uh, and and once those contracts were there, investors started coming in. We put together a financing facility for the first 600 megawatts to come up. Um, and then we started uh, discussing with, with the Egyptian government and uh, EBRD as to, as to what's going to be next. This is a FIT regime. It's at eight and a half cents. Uh, the, the solar tariffs are trending downwards. Um, shouldn't we aspirationally try to uh, do something that encourages, nudges the government to work towards, let's say, um, an auction-based uh, procurement modality. Fine. We, besides a funding envelope of uh, 150 million that we put together, um, there was uh, we we put together a small grant facility of uh, four million dollars that was to um, enable the Egyptians to do 
um, uh, not only um, uh, technical studies on their grid infrastructure, but also aspirationally do um, a study on what could be done on putting in place an auction mechanism. Uh, that was aspirational. We told our board, it may not fly, it may not happen. Uh, and, and we are not sure whether that's that's really going to take off, but it happened. Um, and, and it took off in, in a big way. Um, tariffs went, uh, so, so the, they put in place an architecture for auctions in, in Egypt. Tariffs went down from eight and a half to just about under three uh, cents um, uh, per unit. And and uh, uh, and and now the market is moving on its own. So I think you know it's about demonstrating, um, showing um, stakeholders what can be done, showing them a forward-looking vision, and putting your money to uh, make it happen. And 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 Egypt is one example. We've uh, we've done that in other countries as well. We've done that with the financial system in one of the. Uh, sub-Saharan African countries as well, where we want to get in uh, pension funds and local banks to come in and finance uh, projects. Um, so, uh, you know, we, 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 we offer them to, to come and participate with us in the financing, but also develop mechanisms where they would do financing by themselves going forward. There's no dearth of local currency capital and local currency capital is what is needed to get some of these projects going. Um, in these countries, a lot of these countries cannot afford uh, financing, which is indexed to US dollars. So that's the way we trigger um, uh, countries to move in, in that direction. We trigger regulators to move in that direction. And, and we have had some success like we uh, did in Egypt. I think that's a, that, that's a great example of this kind of bringing together of a shifting in policy and regulation that redistributes risk a bit. And it's kind of a second channel. I mean, one is blended finance, um, ways to basically shape the risk distribution to make it safer for the conventional market to kick in. A second is to redistribute risk by, in some ways, restructuring a bit of the, the sector. But there's a third aspect of this that I want to come back to, to Jagjit, which is some of for, for some of the smaller entrepreneurs who are um, seeking to be able to deliver climate as well as financial returns. Um, in your in, in the solar space, Jagjit, have you seen these kinds of entrepreneurs able to access climate finance? And what in your mind? I mean, you've seen the whole spectrum from design to supply side to now with the ISA. What in your mind are, are the critical support mechanisms to match up the smaller scale businesses who are coming in and often at the forefront of technology innovation with the flows of climate finance? What would it take? Sure. Um, that's a very interesting question. And you know, I, as you were talking, um, uh, I was thinking in my head, what concrete examples I can give you which illustrate the point and also you know, raise the challenge we are up against. So if you look at the solar home system space, I think we, we in Africa have seen a lot of private sector players come in. You know, uh, there is a lot of results-based financing and various sorts of other mechanisms for payment security guarantees economy. Technology has played its role in terms of pay-as-you-go models and various other collection methods. So many, there's an ecosystem which is developing. Of course, it's it's the coverage could still go forward, uh, but you know here's the challenge. So we we studied all the reports from SMAP to GoGla, other market study to see the the growth projections of these market players, who, which are building ecosystem, private entrepreneurs, this that, and the whole ecosystem. Still, they would leave about 300 million people outside this whole bracket of energy access. And we know the grid is not going to go there. So what do you do uh, and create uh, what kind of enabling environment for such a large population where uh, the market as currently conceived is not going? You're not creating entrepreneur. You're not creating a trained workforce. There's incentives are not there. So what at ISA we've been trying to do, and this we, we've started doing in partnership with European Investment Bank uh, through the private sector uh, funding people, is to look at pool procurement methods. So if you look at the peri-urban areas of Nigeria, you look at the refugee populations of Uganda and Rwanda, if you look at, again, 
uh, bottom of pyramid population of DRC, we said, okay, can we put together a package working with government and local institutions of a pool procurement of a solar home system, but with a condition of creating a whole ecosystem of players downstream, local banks, uh, entrepreneurs, trained technicians, and various kind of push uh, or, or, or if you will supply side incentives so that you create this market. And that leads to, again, uh, a whole set of new entrepreneurs coming in. Uh, so this is just one example of how we are working. But if you look at other such interventions, solar water pumps in Africa, it hasn't taken off. Uh, we are trying, you know, uh, Rajiv from GCF has funded a facility through African Development Bank. This is one of the items they want to do, few other interventions. But the numbers of solar water pumps deals we have seen is, you know, somewhere upwards of hundreds or maybe thousands. If you then go to mini grids, we have seen successes, but you know they are struggling to break even. They they absorb subsidy or whatever incentives they get, but the business case is not coming in. So now we forged a partnership with Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, which is in making. You may have heard, you know, Rockefellers, IKEA Foundation, others are coming together. So at our end, what we are trying to do is push for pre-implementation support for project preparations. All this is gonna happen if there is a project, there are players from private sector side who own this project and run with it. And we are making a commitment that in next five years, we're gonna build new capacity pipeline preparation of 10 gigawatts in LDCs. Uh, from a current measure of capacity where they're at four gigawatt, I think it's doubling. So we are working with this uh, alliance to see that we create a new ecosystem of private sector entrepreneurs, plus the blended finance facility proposal we are putting on the table would only invest in pr uh, private enterprises. So those are the two examples. Let me pause there. Thank you. So I think what, what's come up is this really interesting range of, um, in a, of structuring innovation from the financial structure to the regulatory structure to the pooled procurement, um, which I mean has been around for a while for you know, urban, for example, the, the urban development funds in India is kind of distributing risk across a portfolio so that new projects and new types of projects could come in. Um, the one thing that I haven't heard come up in the, in the examples here, I mean, a lot of this has been about making projects safe for safe enough for traditional finance to kick in. What about um, the role of carbon markets or ways to actually value beyond the financial returns, the social and the mitigation returns? What role can carbon markets play um, or any other kind of outcome-based finance in accelerating the conversion of resources into impact? Um, Rajiv, I'd love you. Um, to you know, comment on on what role you see for carbon markets or other ways of, of rewarding non financial outcomes and building that into the structure. No, I think that's uh, that's definitely uh, quite an important um, element uh, of of uh, of what has to go into place in in the near future. Um, uh, I think the uncertainty that had prevailed over the last couple of years on on carbon prices um, uh, is or kind of has a uh, dampened interest quite a bit. Um, but going forward, that will be um, uh, key in, let's say, getting um, industries to change, for instance, um, and presenting them with an alternate uh, revenue stream. And for that, you need to have a mechanism of carbon pricing and incentive for them to move in the direction of climate sustainability. So we, we have, um, we, we did um, uh, finance uh, uh, a renewables framework in Kazakhstan, which um, uh, which also had an element of putting in place a local uh, ETS scheme in place um, and and operationalizing that just to give the market a signal that okay that's the direction in which you can go. It's a nudge, a gentle nudge. Um, it, it's it's. It's just about being set up at this point of time. Uh, it may take a couple of more years um, uh, to, to get operationalized and to have a vibrant market over there. Thereafter, we did another framework um, for um, uh, energy efficiency in, in large scale industries. That's again where we kind of nudged industries to move towards the carbon markets as well. Um, we, we do believe that, you know, okay, from a policy perspective, if you do have uh, 
if you do have market regulations being set up, mechanisms being set up, if industries don't come in, if um, if people who are generating credits don't come in, uh, the market is not going to take off. So we we are attempting to tackle the sub supply side of of carbon credits uh, that that could be released into the market. So I think that raises an interesting question for you, Abhishek. I mean, in some ways, the whole carbon market or any other kind of um, social benefit market, I mean, some of, what, some of what's coming up around methane markets, for example, requires a degree of stability and policy commitment in converting social back into financial returns to reward, as Dr. Mathur mentioned, real impact. From your perspective in the private sector, what do what role can carbon or similar impact markets play and what are some of the, the policy backgrounds or you know, conditions under which that's compelling to blend with the, the traditional sort of financial focus? Yeah, um, I was joking with my colleague the other day, Jessica, on whether I will be able to understand the Bitcoin market much better than carbon market, which is an easier one to, to understand. On a, on a serious note, uh, <clears throat> it makes a bit of a difference. Very honestly, carbon market or carbon trading or any of those does not fundamentally move the economics of any project. The demand supply, the pricing, the returns aren't, aren't adequate enough to, to change the situation of, of making a project from not investable to, to, to more investable. At the core of it, and you know, what are we trying to do through carbon market? We're either trying to incentivize, you know, folks to come and sell their credit. At the same time, there has to be a, a demand side for the polluters to come by. And why will there be a demand? One is there's the corporate social responsibility. Second is the government has to come in and really step in. If you're not, if you're a polluter, if you're not uh, adhering to my norms, you're gonna face penalties, right? Then the question that I ask is why go through the circuitous route of pushing for a carbon market? Why can't there be more direct penal uh, provisions provided, right? So at the core of it, I think, I think if you were to step back here in my mind, it's about, uh, it's about incentivizing green generation or green, green investments. At the same time, you have to penalize you know, folks who are not transitioning to the same. Whether it's through carbon markets, methane market, X, Y, Z, whether it's through direct incentives, you know, and, and, and penalties are, are various means to achieve it. I haven't seen, or we haven't seen, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, noise around it, but there are very few countries who've taken very concrete steps in actually implementing it in this true sense. That's quite a statement, actually, that the, the carbon market, I mean, I think coming from a policy side, um, there's always the hope that uh, policy regulation and um, the valuation of social returns could somehow shape the market. And I, and I think that's, I want to give um, Rajiva a chance to, if you have any follow on comments or response to Abhishek, and then come to you, Jagjit, from the um, from the, the, the solar and the solar entrepreneur perspective, how much this kind of outcome or outcome-based markets matter. But first to you, Rajiv, if you have any um, comments or response to, to Abhishek's point about does the carbon market matter? Well, I think he's uh, partly right. Uh, I, I think the governments have a big role to play over there. Can they really uh, in a sense, incentivize, I, I hate to use the word police the market, but incentive the, incentivize the market to move in that direction. And would they be able to put in place a, a predictable regime in which um, this market would operate? I think that's a big challenge. Um, and, and the EU has, has done it and, and, and it's fairly successful. Can it move out of the EU and be replicated elsewhere? Wait and watch. Big question. Um, Jagjit, over to you for the from the you know the the ISA perspective. How much do these outcome-based or carbon markets, methane markets, uh, social return markets matter, or is it more about intervening and distributing the risk in more conventional markets? Well, um, given the small size of DRE interventions in in itself the kind of carbon revenue that will come in um, 
I'm not sure that would tip the balance. And so what we've been trying to explore with EESL in India and through a program of activities as they call in carbon world in UNFCCC and beyond is to see if we could aggregate these projects, let's say in sub-Saharan Africa and of the solar projects, which are distributed small and then pull these and sell it to a buyer in a forward market or when they are realized and then bring these revenues to incentivize these players to do more or maybe help them in, in continuation of the work they are doing. At, at ISA, the kind of demand I talked about, 4.5 gigawatt, that's where we are trying to explore this. But again, it's exploratory. I think they have much bigger challenges in getting the base capital. You know, we, we, we talk to bilateral funding agencies and multilateral, and you know, our client countries include South Sudan, Ivory Coast, um, and others and others, uh, where the credit rating, um, if you will, or the debt sustainability framework of World Bank IMF puts them on a high default risk. So uh, even the bilateral funding agencies, exim banks of the countries, they are finding it very difficult to finance. So uh, I'm not sure if carbon uh, revenue is going to tip the balance. So there I agree with Abhishek. But uh, I think on a, on a broader scale, if you start doing aggregations, then these things uh, um, show some, some value. And then if you could sell it uh, to more uh, kind of uh, people who put premium on these things, whether these are the RE hundreds of the world or some Nordic countries and others and others who are prepared to put an extra dollar or two or three or four on such high social impact investments, then it makes sense. And at our end, we are trying to see if, if a solar home system at somebody's house is helping women uh, away from indoor air pollution while they're cooking. So if you bundle all those benefits, sustainable benefits, along with climate benefit, then maybe there is a dollar value which will tip the balance. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a labor of love. Uh, you know, you have to put in a lot of work, aggregate and do that, uh, but we, we are trying. And I think all the panelists are trying their best effort, but it's a hard knot. Let's see if UNFCCC could deliver Article 6 framework this time around. That would create another opportunity for various players to come in. Thank you. Yeah, I think you say labor of love, but I think I just want to relabel it as a very high leverage shift um, because that kind of that kind of packaging could change a lot of the a lot of the flows. Um, before we move into the the final um, sort of section of the panel on what's going right, what's going wrong, and the wish list, I want to step back. We've been using. Uh, renewable energy um, as kind of an example sector for how climate finance can work. But the, the question to Abhishek and Rajiv is what other priority areas of investment do you have on your lists uh, to expedite decarbonization? Um, another way to put it might be what other ISA-like entities in what other sectors would be maybe your top one or two um, on your wish list? So. Uh, Abhishek, over to you. Uh, what's what are the other priority areas beyond? I, I think I think no, no. We 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 extremely excited about this broader theme beyond just solar wind on the of the energy transition side of things. Right. Um, some of the mega themes that we are we very closely looking at is the entire electrification of the transportation and the associated infrastructure. Uh, and you know it's 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 playing out in the developed markets. It started to play out in the developing markets. Uh, I think some of the some of the associated frameworks. If I were to just give an example of India, uh, the reason why solar took off or renewables took off is because you had an entity like Seki, which came in and aggregated and took the risk away. Right? EVs is not where you, if, if you especially if you're doing with uh, with the counterparties which are municipalities and likes of those, you need intervening uh, entities like that. Right? But again, that's that's one thing which we are extremely excited about. The other thing which we are very closely watching is hydrogen. Uh, we do we do believe it's it, it's a bit behind EVs, but we do believe it can be a good game changer, um, uh, especially around how you know some of the traditional sectors like steel refineries, right, which are which are the biggest polluters, uh, honestly, out there, right. Uh, 
CCCUS, you know, you keep talking about that. It's more futuristic, uh, I guess. You know, we haven't seen, I haven't come across any project which is, uh, forget investable, it's close to being investable even in the next few years. So I think those are, those are, those are up there. Uh, and then there are all these associated infrastructure goes with it, right? So the entire smart grid infrastructures, the smart metering infrastructure. So anything that improves energy efficiency or makes it more green, is an area of interest. And Jessica, I mean, there is, I, I did allude to it in the past as well, there is a lot of capital out there, which is chasing the energy transition theme. Uh, so it just, you know, needs to find its way out to all of these, uh, these new areas. But it's very exciting time, very exciting time from an from energy transition investment perspective. It's also kind of a bridge building time, um, just to, to connect these things. Uh, Rajiv, what are your thoughts on priority areas of investment or you know, to pick up on that last point, priority bridges to build between all the capital that's out there and the innovation as usual um, that is in need of capital? So I think uh, I'll attack uh, the last point first, uh, Jessica. Um, innovation has to be viewed from a country specific lens. What is innovation, let's say in a large uh, emitting economy like India or a large emitting economy like South Africa may not necessarily be the same in a much smaller LDC. So I think we, we got to view it from that perspective. They have to be tailor-made solutions for each uh, economy uh, that suit their needs, specific needs. And, and so from that perspective, I would say uh, for the larger economies, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's aspirational for us to uh, come up with uh, mechanisms in which we uh, mobilize money through capital markets. Uh, for some of these emergent themes that Abhishek has spoken about, I think we have pretty much aligned on those. Uh, we have uh, successfully pivoted ourselves away from energy and have uh, moved towards um, uh, new themes such as e-mobility, um, uh, adaptation agri value chains, um, uh, which which have a significant potential for decarbonization, but how do you get the money into those? Can, can we use uh, can we use the green bond market? Can we use the uh, capital markets? Can we recycle some of the existing assets to uh, kind of you know, uh, build build pool vehicles that could finance? Um, new ideas going forward. I think that's something that we are very keenly looking at. And at the very heart of it is uh, what I had initially spoken about was the GCF playing a catalytic role in getting some of these vehicles going and mobilizing local currency financing um, to de-risk risk perceptions within the country. Um, so that's aspirational. And you would see a lot of that coming from the GCF in the near future. Please watch this space. That's exciting. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, and I have kind of the last parting question for the three of you, which in some ways is you know, back to your take on the current trends in climate finance and your observation of the most thorny obstacles to scaling it up, scaling up the impact, most importantly, and your you know one or two kind of wish list for how climate finance evolves. So I'm gonna give you a second to gather your thoughts and, and sort of abuse my privilege as moderator to say that what I, where I hope climate finance goes and continues to go is in its ability to be flexible and responsive to emerging science and to our emerging understanding of impacts. And I'll take, you know, in the energy transition, for example, as we look at scaling up electrification of say more of the vehicle fleet, uh, more of heavy industry, et cetera, we're also looking at a dramatic shift in what kind of resources we need and where they come from. Now, the consequences of extracting some of those resources are unknown but emerging and at this point, not monetized, but highly likely to have a financial impact um, down the road. How do we get better at recognizing that, building that in, and having more responsive, impact-seeking climate finance. Um, so I hope that we can get some of these impact uh, markets to work and to blend better. Um, I think it's a tall order, so that's my wish. But now over to the three of you. Um, Jagjit, I've, I haven't called on you in a bit, but what is? how do you see current trends in climate finance globally? Um, what 
is the obstacle that keeps you up at night. And from your ISA or your World Bank or your negotiator hat, you as Jagjeet, what do you hope that the world gets moving on quickly? Hmm. So uh, I, I've spoken enough about, you know, more climate finance or catalytic finance or all kind of finance going to solve access problems. But let me continue with the theme of our speakers on energy transition. So at ISA, for the last three years, we've been incubating an idea uh, of one sun, one world, one grid. I don't know if you've heard of it, but, you know, Honorable Prime Minister of India put it out in 2018 that sun never sets. If we could connect the you know, uh, energy consumers of the world with the renewable energy producers of the world, then we have some fighting chance of expediting energy transition through renewables. You know, in Europe, we know interconnectors trading of electricity makes all economic sense, whether it's investments or just economic efficiency or discovering fair prices and all that. So at ISA, we've been working on this. Last year, we commissioned a study with EDF France to look at sun as a battery using different and time difference in various geographies, Middle East, India, ASEAN, to see if we could you know, have transfers of electrons one way or other. When it's evening in India, it's still sun shining in Middle East and peak time, peak energy load in India. So if you could connect Oman to uh, coast of Kutch in Gujarat, you're talking about big shift in energy transitions. And now we have joined hands with COP Presidency UK in their idea of green grids initiative. So at COP, you will see this mouthful of initiative, GGI also walk, green grid initiative, one sun, one world, one grid. Idea is to push for greening all kinds of grids from mini grids up to mega grids, push for uh, greening the grids and interconnections in the regions and interregions. And we would be working with all MDBs and DFIs and GCF to push for more climate finance going and greening the grids and interconnectors across countries, across regions. And if we could do that, um, all the assessments from IEA to our study suggest that we would make a real dent in the energy transition uh, challenge we all hope to solve. Let me pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Abhishek, over to you for um, climate finance or adjacent energy transition wish. Yeah, um, it was very interesting to hear Jagjit, that's, that's really big stuff, right? And, and, and I think we need to think bold, dream bold, uh, then only you can implement some of these uh, transformational ideas. So, so, so kudos to you guys uh, there, uh, Jagjit. I think for me, it's, it's, uh, it, it's rather, uh, I, would, I would say more straightforward. Uh, all the puzzles of a financing uh, or say, uh, you know, financing a project are still not in place, uh, especially for projects that are still on the periphery of, of uh, investable, being investable. For example, the debt market or the bond market or the credit market is extremely, you know, we as equity investors still have the appetite to take risk, the, you know, uh, the debt market. And that's something which, which we, need, we think needs to be deepened. Uh, yes, there's been concepts of green bonds, you need to go and see how effective the green bonds have been. I mean, I remember, I haven't seen it now, at least a year and a half back, I saw green bonds were trading at best at four bips of uh, discount to regular bonds. There's frankly, and with, with a much, much shallow market, right? So there's, there's not that much of a of, of movement that has happened, right? So again, I think the, the aspects of, of aligning the credit market with the equity market that is coming in uh, is one of the biggest, because all of these are capital intensive projects cannot always be financed through either concessional capital or high cost equity. There has to be a, a significant amount of, of, of suitable debt that needs to come in. So that's, that's one of the big challenges that you see. The second is a bit more tactical, but you know, Jessica, when you were talking about impact, one of the biggest issues that I see is impact measurement. I mean, how do you measure impact? I mean, you hire consultants, they have their own philosophy, frameworks. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Now we want to measure big dollar investments and measure impact beyond. We, we know the, the financial metrics. The impact metrics are somewhere fuzzy, right? So I think a bit more of, of, of uh, uh, uniform framework or ways of, of measuring reporting is something which will do good to this broader theme of climate or impact-based climate financing, not much more good. Yeah, 
I mean, it's the alignment of um, what is the feedback and what's the informationally efficient way to get that feedback fast and in an audible way. Um, so Rajiv, we're going to, we're going to um, close with your observations on the current state of climate finance and your wish list. But I also just wanted to add a couple of questions that have come in from the audience um, about the GCF. So if you can add to your, in your closing remarks. The first is um, whether the GCF has a different framework for assessing projects that come from less developed countries and the middle income countries since they have high impact uh, but bigger risk. And I think related to that, you had mentioned earlier um, local currency finance and dollar-based finance. How does the GCF um, and you know, or your peers deal with currency risk uh, for LDCs? Um, so in addition to your observations, those are two questions that came up in the audience. And I think we'll, we'll close with your parting words on that. Uh, thanks, Jessica. And I think Abhishek uh, stole my thunder on the matrix bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, but the other thing that you know uh, bothers us quite a bit, um, and and I would say if you look at let's say the mobile phone market, for instance, introduced in the 1990s uh, in the Western world, um, took uh, the developing world by storm around the uh, uh, the uh, sec the first decade of uh, 2000. Um, now, uh, there are new technologies coming up in, in the developed world, e-mobility, battery storage, green hydrogen. Um, how long will they uh, take to come to, let's say, the developing world? There would be uh, larger countries like India, China, South Africa, Brazil, which may be able to adopt some of these technologies early on. Um, but what about the rest of the world? Um, could there be a mechanism in which uh, these technologies can be can become affordable enough for uh, some of the LDCs and the SIDs to afford them? I think that's a question that uh, we we worry about quite a lot, um, and and uh, that's why we have been uh, you know as as we do our transactions, pooling countries in our transactions to achieve that kind of scale uh, through which a technology can come through to uh, countries. Um, and, and coming to the question on LDCs specifically, um, so um, we pretty much do not differentiate between countries as such, all countries um, that, um, that, that are uh, in the developing world uh, and are signatories uh, to the Paris Agreement are eligible for GCF financing. Um, uh, we look at each project on its own merits and um, and and what's the what's the climate narrative over there? What's uh, the let's say the additionality GCF brings to the picture? How would GCF transform those uh, those countries by financing these ideas? That's what we essentially look at. So if let's say uh, we are going to be looking at let's say uh, an idea in a large economy like South Africa, the considerations would be very different from the uh, from let's say looking at a similar project in Zimbabwe for instance, which is a LDC. Um, uh, so for, for South Africa, we would look at, let's say, uh, uh, a mechanism by which, uh, you know, we transform the market. But um, in, in smaller countries, we tend to look at uh, smaller ideas, um, uh, which uh, could emerge as proofs of concept. And, and therefore, we have uh, certain modalities within, within the GCF, and I'll talk about two of them. One is a project preparation facility that, uh, that, we, uh, that we deploy very frequently uh, to develop early stage ideas to get to a stage of financing. And then we have a simplified approval process for smaller ideas that uh, ultimately can, can make a difference in these countries. Uh, and Jessica, could you remind me what the second question was? So you've given uh, you, you'd given your wish list. The second was about currency risk. Um, anything that GCF does to to address the currency risk that's inherent in some of the less developed countries. So um, uh, so we have um, uh, currently we have a limitation in terms of our financing goes out in in US dollars. However, we have found a workaround. Um, uh, by providing financing lines to uh, through our um, accredited entities in the developing countries, uh, so the we provide a dollar line to the banks, whereas the banks would then 
downstream provide a local currency financing to the projects. We are looking at, um, I would say over the next one, one and a half year, and you would hear more about it, uh, ways in which we could do direct local currency financing potentially. Uh, that is something which could come up, but at, as of now, that's not there. So we are um, deploying a workaround. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to the panelists for kind of moving back and forth between the sort of big picture innovation to the nitty gritty details and examples of how climate finance does work and could work better. I think, um, I'm, I hope that, uh, sorry, we didn't have more time for, for Q&A from all the participants, but I hope this has been a good um, overview of the state of things. And thanks again to IntelliCup for putting this panel together. Back to you, Urvashi. Thank you so much, Jessica, for driving this conversation. And thank you to all our panelists, Rajiv, Jagjit, and Abhishek for an incredible discussion. Let's really hope the carbon markets get easier to understand than crypto. <laughs> I think that's going to stay with me. Um, I'm just going to move on quickly to the next short segment that we have. Um, an encouraging indication of the progress of climate change is the increase in numbers that we've seen of entrepreneurial solutions to improve energy access and driving forward circular approaches to business. We've had some incredible applications from this sector, and I would now like to introduce my colleague, Margaret Nakunza, who will present the Sankalp Global Award for the sector of energy and, the, and circular economy. Over to you, Margaret. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Margaret Nakunza. I'm coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya. I will be your host for the Sankup Global Awards 2021, where we will continue to celebrate entrepreneurs and their role in impacting millions around the world. We will be honoring the five most promising social enterprises across sectors. On behalf of the Avishka Group, Intelecup, and Sankup, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the 13th edition of the Sankup Global Awards. 2021. The Sankov Awards are one of the Global South's most prestigious social enterprise awards. Over the years, Sankov has recognized more than 2,400 social enterprises and channeled more than $270 million to high impact businesses. The awards are designed to support young companies and recognize their impact, which is successfully steering change. This year, we had an overwhelming number of entries with over 250 applications from 52 countries globally. Each enterprise went through three rounds of assessments, and finally, 10 of the best enterprises pitched to a esteemed grand jury from Asia, America, and Africa. I'd like to introduce today's theme of energy and climate change. Climate change is a global phenomenon that significantly impacts our lives across the globe. Rising global temperatures cause sea levels to rise, increase the number of extreme weather events, and increase the spread of tropical diseases. All these have costly impacts on basic services, infrastructure, housing, human livelihoods, and health. In the recently concluded United Nations General Assembly, U.S. President Biden offered a key pledge on climate finance, wherein the U.S. will increase funding for developing countries to $11.4 billion by 2024. However, this is not even close to the $100 billion pledged by developed countries to poorer nations to combat climate change. Cities are a key contributor to climate change, as urban activities are major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Estimates suggest that cities are responsible for 75% of global carbon dioxide emissions, with transport and buildings being among the largest contributors. Many cities are already taking positive strides by using renewable energy sources, cleaner production techniques, and regulations or incentives to limit industrial emissions. Significant progress has been made since 2010 in regards to access to energy, 
both in urban and rural areas. In particular, electrification through decentralized renewable-based solutions have gained momentum. For example, the number of people connected to mini grids has more than doubled between 2010 and 2019 growing from 5 to 11 million people. Though more people have access to electricity, an estimated 759 million still have no access to electricity, which affects agricultural productivity, economic activity, and so much more. To compound the issues of climate change, waste management is a massive global challenge. Underdeveloped waste management infrastructure may be a growing sign of global inequity as climate change advances. The waste that is recycled or disposed of is mostly done by an informal sector, which has underdeveloped structures and reduced capacities to cater for the amount of waste produced. In 2018 alone, over 2 billion metric tons of municipal solid waste were produced annually worldwide. If current conditions persist, global waste production is estimated to increase by 70%. New circular and regenerative business models are needed to offer alternatives to usage and ownership. In this new economy, there is a large role for innovators that can set the standards for others to follow. We'd like to feature two of these enterprises today. Our first nominee is Aurora Global from India. City from India.
and the winner for the Sankup Global Awards 2021 for Energy and Climate Change is Recity from India. We will now have a word from the winner. Hi everyone, I am Meha, co-founder of Recity and I'm very happy to share the stage with my co-founder Suraj Nand Kumar here. Thank you so much to the Sankalp Global Award team, the Grand Jury Selection Team for selecting ReCD out of 257 enterprise applicants as the winner for the Sankalp Global Awards 2021. Truly, it's an honor to us to recognize ReCD in its journey to keep plastics in the economy and out of the environment. We would like to send our deepest gratitude to our amazing team ReCD, to our wonderful investors who have invested their trust in the company to my family, to all of ReCity's partners and customers all over the world. Thank you so much. Please stop by our virtual booth. We would love to connect with you and really hope that we would work together in the future. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into the Sankup Global Awards 2021. Please join me in congratulating the winner and all of Sankup Award finalists. You can visit the enterprises in the virtual exhibition space to learn more about them. If you're interested in investing in any of these amazing companies, please feel free to reach out to me via the virtual platform. We hope you enjoyed the summit. Thank you, Margaret, and congratulations once again to the ReCity team. This was the last award we have to present for this year's Sankal Global Awards 2021. I was truly inspired by all the award finalists this year. They're doing such incredible work and they keep me energetic about Sankal's work. Our entrepreneurs make the endless emails and late nights all worth it. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners, our team and our leadership. To our partners like Bayer, Cartier Women's Initiative, Energy Catalyst, the World Economic Forum, Bopping, O-Farms, IFC, USAID, and Sabrit. You helped us drive conversations and collaborations for some of the Global South's most pressing issues. To the Sankal team, Ariel, George, Naomi, Margaret, Ambika, Kanishka, and Sudanshu, and to all our colleagues who have joined us to make Sankal a reality, thank you. Sankalp is truly a team effort. And of course, a big thank you to our CEO Vikas for steering us in the right direction and your unwavering support. Last but not least, thanks to you, our participants. This community makes Sankalp such an incredible platform. Thank you for sharing your insights, for being open to collaborations and for mobilizing change. I have no doubt that this community will change the world and will drive significant progress towards the sustainable development goals. You still have one more chance to catch some of our inspiring entrepreneurs at this evening's slumber party and the networking won't stop today. We will leave the networking platform open for you until next week. So please keep the conversations going and the meetings flowing. I hope you had a fantastic Sankalp and don't forget to mark your calendars for Sankalp Africa Summit, which will take place from March 1st to 3rd, 2022. We hope to host you all in person again soon and until next time, all the best. Good night.